So I hope you all are excited too. Um, we are going to ask everybody to please remain muted in, during the call and to type any questions that you have into the chat, um, which we will monitor and answer as we have time. Um, I also wanted to let everybody know that we are recording this session and we will make it available on our YouTube channel afterwards for your reference. I'm joined today by our expert, Avery Hill. Avery has been working as a staff researcher at Ballotpedia since 2019. He studied economic public policy and analytics at Bryant University, has received a master's certificate in professional communication, and has a JD from Liberty University. Avery is also an attorney with certificates in constitutional law and an officer in the United States Marine Corps. And now I will go ahead and turn it over to Avery. Hey everyone, I hope you guys can see and hear me. Sarah, that was an awesome introduction. Thanks for uh, sharing those details. I've been studying constitutional law for quite some time and it is truly my passion, specifically campaign finance law. Uh, today, I'm just going to be sharing with you the basics of campaign finance law and that's because it's such a pervasive, large topic that if you ever go to law school or decide to go to law school, you will study constitutional law and it will have big textbooks like this where almost nearly half of what you learn will just be about the First Amendment. And the most important topic within the First Amendment is of course the freedom of speech. And within the freedom of speech, that of whether or not you can participate in politics by no donations and participating in other ways associated with campaign finance. So there's a lot to cover. That all being said, this is just an introductory class. We're just going to be covering the basics. If you want to learn more, there are so many sources I can provide you, so many awesome books. And of course you can get involved locally and assist with politicians in your area. And by going to law school and learning more about this or taking local civics classes that are being held in your area. So before we jump into the presentation, I just wanna give you an overview about what we'll be covering today. First, what exactly campaign finance law is at the most basic, simple level, and then the history of campaign finance. Uh, the history of campaign finance is it dates all the way back to our founding fathers when there were no campaign finance laws. Like what did they do to trigger the need for campaign finance reform or laws and regulations? Then we'll get into some major court cases, campaign finance law today, how it looks, and what it would be like working with money in an actual campaign office. And if you were running for office, what would you have to do to file with the FEC? But before we get started, I do want to make a quick announcement. Ballotpedia is giving away some awesome swag today. Uh, if you complete a review sheet that I created to help us all stay focused and on track during this presentation, what I'm going to do now is actually drop a link in the chat for this review sheet. So if you're with us via computer, you can click on this link here and see review questions that will go along with the presentation. I love when professors do this during classes. It keeps me on track. So I'd like to pass that along to you all, my new students. Um, and every time you see a light bulb, like we have in the bottom left-hand corner of this uh, slide right here, that means an answer to one of the questions on the review sheet is on that slide. So that's when you can flip over to the review sheet and look for that answer and answer it correctly on the sheet. I'll be providing answers to all of these questions at the end of the presentation. Second, I have a pause symbol next to the lightning, uh, the light bulb at the bottom. That pause symbol, whenever you see it, is going to be a review slide. We're just gonna kind of review the most important details of what we've learned so far. And then you'll see a large yellow box. That's a summary box. I've provided them for every court case we're gonna to cover today. So if the details seem a little bit uh, uh, mushy or hard to understand, you can always just refer back to the summary on the main page about what the court case is actually about. And if you see a blue circle, that's the last symbol at the bottom of the slide. That means we're gonna be breezing through this Supreme Court case. But the good news is, even if I don't read everything on the slide to you today, I'm gonna to be providing a copy of this slideshow to you so that you can use it moving forward. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm going to be leaving my chat box open. Feel free to drop them in, 
just keep yourself muted, type in those questions, and I'll do my best to pause every few slides and check for questions. I wanna make sure you fully understand the content that we're going through today, because campaign finance really is such an important topic, and it deals with one of our most important rights, and that is the freedom of speech, as I've already mentioned. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and move on to the presentation itself. What is federal campaign finance law? Simply put, it's how candidates for office can raise and spend money and how much and how frequently you can donate to political campaigns. How do you get involved? How much can you give and to what entities can you give? There are more people to donate to to participate in politics than just candidates. There's political parties at the local, state, and national level and independent expenditure organizations that we'll be talking about today. Those are organizations like political action committees and super PACs. Those are organizations you hear so much about. And we're gonna be covering what those are and how they work in politics along with campaign finance. But the reason campaign finance law isn't studied as just a topic within constitutional law or a topic within First Amendment freedoms and is instead taught as a separate course of and within itself is because it is a multi-dimensional uh, study. It has so much involved in it outside of the law. It deals with public sentiment, how people feel, psychology, current events. There's so much wrapped up in campaign finance law that it's oftentimes taught as a separate course entirely, an entirely separate subject matter. Now, typically, if I was in a classroom with you all and teaching this as a professor, I would use a whiteboard and draw some drawings on there that you may or may not understand, but they're best to give you a 10,000 foot view of what campaign finance law is all about. So I've done that. I've drawn some drawings, uh, took pictures of them and included them on here to share what I think campaign finance law looks from that 10,000 foot high view before we dive into the details of what campaign finance law is. So I think there are three dimensions to campaign finance law, a scale, a public sentiment, and the practicality of what campaign finance law looks like in the field of an election. We're gonna start out with the famous scale. We're gonna to cover tons of Supreme Court cases today. And you could just read the language of those cases and find answers about what rules you have to follow as a candidate. But it's even better to understand what those Supreme Court justices had to think and weigh when they were making decisions. And that's the first dimension of campaign finance. What do Supreme Court justices have to keep in mind when rendering opinions about campaign finance law? Well, they have to keep in mind that this is an area related to freedom of speech and they need to keep that protected while also protecting the integrity of our democracy. And every decision that's made will really weigh on whether or not we need to add more weight or more buff to the integrity of our democracy or open up and add more weight to the freedom of speech depending on where we are in history. And history plays such an important role in all of this. As you'll see, it is the public sentiment that drives new laws. Next, we have the practicality of the game. If you've ever worked in a campaign office, I've worked in numerous. I love the fact that campaigns have to have fuel to operate. You can't just be a lone wolf in politics. You have to have friends and families, volunteers and supporters all around you. Well, say the fuel that you give politicians is water. You need water to live. Campaigns need money to survive. We'll say that fuel is water. We already know that there's gonna be some imperfections in any water. Say you pour a glass of water, your cat may lick it, germs are in it, no water is pure. And the court understands they can't make sure every donation to every campaign is perfectly pure. Instead, what we can do is just make sure there's no pervasive problems in campaign finance. There's no oil spill in the fuel or water that we're giving to candidates. We wanna make sure that the integrity of our democracy stays intact, even though we have to understand that things aren't perfect in the field. And this is the last big philosophical thing before we get into the details. But like I said, we also have to keep public sentiment in line. Uh, public sentiment or the people's views on certain topics are very important to the Supreme Court, and that's usually a driving factor of decisions that are being made. This chart 
is just a rough estimate, uh, estimate of how history has driven campaign finance laws. At the very beginning, our founding fathers did not need campaign finance laws because there was no perceived level of corruption our country was brand new. There was no history or track record of corruption in politics. So we didn't need campaign finance laws. But as time goes on and more and more examples of uh, corruption in finance and specifically campaign finance took place, we needed to add some restrictions to campaign finance. Say President Roosevelt is alleged to have accepted corporate donations. Then the Tillman Act came in place. The Watergate scandal drove the largest campaign finance regulation ever, as we'll learn more about later today. And this ebbs and flows over time. As people trust the government more, campaign finance gets relaxed. And then as people have more and more uh, examples of corruption to base their opinion off of, more and more uh, campaign finance regulations are needed in the court. Now, all of the court decisions that are made are delayed. You know, the court takes time to react to things. So as soon as there's a problem, the court takes a few years to fix it. And by the time they fix it, there's another problem. So they're kind of constantly chasing their tail there. Now we're going to dive on into the actual details. That was just a 10,000 foot view of what campaign finance law is all about. So how did we get here? How did we need a campaign finance from the beginning? Well, that has to do with our founding fathers. Uh, these are mythical beings, people we thought who had unwavering integrity. But as you dig into the history, you find out they provided us some of the first examples of needs for campaign finance. So it started with small things. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, they found out one of the best ways to get their opinions out about politics was to write op-eds and newspaper articles so they could reach more people than just door-to-door -door speeches to neighbors. Now they thought we could take this to the next level and they actually built the National Gazette, a newspaper to spread specific policy ideas for their political party. All of the op-eds and news articles about politics either supported their opinion or were hit pieces against their enemies. Well, what happened was farmers and laborers spoke up and they thought, you know, I wanna run for office, but I don't have the money. I don't have the clout. I don't have the, the way to get my speech out like the founding fathers did. I don't own a newspaper and I never could and states started to regulate, well, maybe you can't use newspapers to spread your opinion. And then George Washington came along and he gave us the best example of quid pro quo corruption in votes. Uh, in the 1792 race for his reelection to presidency, George Washington took out $600, about $3,000 in our time and bought hard cider, stood at the polls and passed out beer and hard cider to people who confirmed they voted for him in the polls. At the time, there were no regulations stopping this sort of behavior, but people started to ponder, you know, should this be allowed? Is this okay to literally trade alcohol for votes? Maybe we need to regulate this. And then Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr took things to the next level. This is where corporations started getting involved in politics. They found out that money was the most important tool for a campaign. And if I had all the money in the world, I could make anyone a politician. But to get more money, they needed to collect more money. And they didn't necessarily think they could do it from donations. So they started a bank, a bank of New York Mellon, which was to fund the Federalist operation. So as people invested in the bank, they would take that money and invest it into politics and return just a small interest rate to their users at the bank. And states really started to crack down. They said, now with corporations involved, presidents trading beer for alcohol and newspapers solely for the purpose of spreading political ideas, maybe we need to regulate this. And all the states had their own regulations on campaign finance, but the federal government didn't think it was time for them to speak yet. And that was when Andrew Jackson spoke up. He was one of the first presidents during a presidential campaign to say, I am not accepting corporate donations or any donations at all. And instead, we'll only have a volunteer workforce. And he started campaign offices all across the United States and hired thousands and thousands and thousands of people to get out and learn uh, about his opinions, to spread his views to people all over the country without donations. But the first federal campaign finance regulations occurred during this time as well. And that's because while Andrew Jackson started this movement of not accepting corporate donations, some presidential candidates and people running for House and Senate realized that they had a lot of pool in the federal government. If they were to be elected to office, 
they could literally determine whether or not a federal employee kept their job. So they used to go down to the naval yards in many coastal cities and say, hey, look, guys, I'll make sure you all keep your job if you give me five dollars uh, to participate in this political election. And sure enough, it worked. People were getting tons of donations by soliciting federal employees for donations. And the federal government said, finally, a time we can step in. This is in our ballpark. Politicians, you are no longer allowed to write to solicit donations from federal employees. And so the Naval Appropriations Act was created as the first ever campaign finance regulation. And this was eventually extended because while they couldn't solicit donations, threats of losing your job still floated around the industry. So eventually the Pendleton Service Reform Act was created to make sure that no one's job would be in jeopardy if they decided not to participate in a certain political election. And we'll take a quick second for you guys to go and answer the first question on the review sheet. It was there. Then we'll move on to the Tillman Act. So Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt, one of our past presidents, he done messed up during his campaign for office in a way he didn't even realize at the time because federal campaign finance law did not regulate corporate donations. But after he won uh, in office, many people who disagreed with his opinions said the only reason he won was because he accepted thousands of dollars of corporate donations. And Theodore Roosevelt wanted to make sure that people did not question his integrity. He didn't know he was doing wrong at the time because there were no regulations in place to stop these sort of corporate donations. So he decided to give a very beautiful speech that barred corporation donations for good. He specifically said all contributions by corporations to any political committee or for any political purpose should be forbidden by law. And so the Tillman Act, the third campaign finance reform at the federal level, was passed to limit corporate donations. This is when the First Amendment right to free speech started to really stir up in constitutional law. Because we have to remember, corporations are thought to be people. They pay taxes, they have individual tax IDs. Do they have the same rights that people do? And after the Tillman Act, this question was pervasive in politics and law, and we really needed to try and find an answer. Now, corporations were one of many organizations to be limited in how they can participate in politics. We're going to breeze through this, uh, this case here, but I definitely recommend looking up later and reading more about it. But right after the Tillman Act was passed, tons of other entities came forward and said, what about me? Am I allowed to speak in politics? Of course, unions were part of that, but the government stood firm and said, no, unions cannot participate in politics either. Neither can nonprofits. And many other organizations were stripped of what they believed was their right to free speech. There was, of course, a dissent that said, maybe you guys are thinking wrong about this opinion. Justice Douglas said, that the principle at stake is not peculiar to unions. But what if the court today said that churches couldn't participate in politics and preachers couldn't preach at the pulpit about what ideas were good for their church? Would you question whether or not this is a First Amendment right? And it really made the other justices ponder and lower federal court justices, uh, judges start to think, maybe this issue is bigger than we thought. It's not just corporations, but if we ban corporations, unions, and nonprofits from speaking, What's going to stop churches and activist organizations like, say, Greenpeace or other local activist groups from also speaking up about political issues? And so came the Federal Campaign Act. So, as I said, everything stems from history. And while we thought campaign finance reform was strict enough, we had the Watergate scandal. And after the Watergate scandal, the people were very scared. Public sentiment uh, perceived levels of corruption were higher than they had ever been. And so the Supreme Court had to act. And the following year, they put in place the Federal Election Campaign Act. After 60 years of regulations, this made things even tighter. And while there were federal campaign finance rules in place before, there was never a federal campaign finance police. There was no one to really enforce the rules. All you could do was say someone broke the rules and question their integrity. And at the time in politics, especially federal politics, your integrity, your moral value was everything. So if someone questioned you of wrongdoing, you'd be like President Roosevelt and be making speeches that 
bar corporate donations, you would be doing anything you possibly could to fix your reputation. But as history moved forward and we had things like the Watergate scandal, people thought maybe it's not good enough just to question someone's integrity. We need to create a police force. And so the Federal Election Commission was created. Now, you've probably heard the Federal Election Commission be called the FEC. The FEC is responsible for disclosing campaign finance and for more information and enforcing all the rules that you've seen be created thus far. So the commission, while it has many employees and many attorneys that work in the tens of thousands of elections throughout the United States, it's led by six commissioners. And these six commissioners are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And they oversee creating new regulations regarding campaign finance. Now, there are supposed to be six members on that commission, but right now there are only three, typically to prevent partisanship so that this organization doesn't become like any other political body. You can only have three members of any one political party that sit on the commission at the same time. Right now, there are only three commissioners and they serve from three different political parties. The chair is a Republican, the vice chair an independent, and our other sitting member is a Democrat. There have been numerous presidential nominations to fill the vacancies, but the Senate has not yet confirmed any new seats to take place on the Federal Election Commission. So what does it mean when there are less than six members of the FEC in place? Well, you need four votes to make any changes to federal election law so that there's no partisanship or party line voting that could change campaign finance laws. So right now, there's a bit of gridlock in the FEC and no new decisions can be made related to adding or taking away federal election laws because there are not enough members to vote on new regulations. So the FECA, what we just talked about, the new federal law that was put in place after the Watergate scandal, they set new rules. And these new rules were stricter than any rules had been before. They set contribution limits, annual or aggregate limits to how much you could donate, and expenditure limits. So everyone, the candidate, the donor, and businesses were all regulated in how they could spend. At the time, you could only donate $1,000 to a political candidate or $5,000 to a political committee or party. But even if you donated $1,000 to a candidate and you wanted to donate more to another candidate, you were limited in how much you could spend in a given year. You could only spend $25,000 total every year. And then there were expenditure limits as well. So how much could a candidate spend of their own money or their family's wealth to run for office? Now, these are rules that haven't been in place for some 50 years now. But at one time, if you were running for president, you could only spend up to $50,000 of your own money. We know that's certainly not the case today. We have numerous political candidates that even announced they would not accept donations and instead would run just using their family's wealth. I know uh, Michael Bloomberg, President Donald Trump, and other candidates used uh, lots of their own money to run for office. But at the time in the 1970s, that was against the rules. That was until Buckley versus Vallejo. So I was actually reviewing some notes from law school today, and I wrote under Buckley versus Vallejo that this was the most important first, uh, first Amendment freedom of speech case. And at the time, it was considered to be so before citizens united. But at the time, Buckley versus Vallejo uh, raised the question, can there be corruption from donations if the person donating doesn't ever actually talk to the candidate who's running for office? And the court thought it was a good question and one they would take up. At the time, U.S. Senator Buckley, along with the Republican Party, Libertarian Party, Peace and Freedom Party, and numerous other organizations came together and said, we should be able to raise money and spend money independent of candidates, what we now think of as political action committees or super PACs. Now, they said that if I want to donate money to another organization that runs commercials or TV ads and support for a certain presidential, senatorial, or congressional candidate, I never speak to the candidate. So how could I have a quid pro quo relationship with that candidate? And the court said, you know, I think you're right. I think we should allow independent expenditures with no limits. And so they did, and that was uh, the new rule of the land. That was 
just one of the decisions made in Buckley versus Blau. However, individual contribution limits, only being able to donate a $1,000 donation to any one candidate, stayed in place. Government said that's exactly what we're trying to regulate, that quid pro quo relationship with a candidate. And so new rules were drawn again, limit expenditures were crossed out, expenditure limitations were crossed out, and so we were just left with annual limitations or aggregate limitations and contribution limits to candidates. But this case also did something, and that was parse out the terminology of campaign finance. They said to think about campaign finance, we need to do more than just think about campaign finance as a whole, but break it down. What do we mean when we say campaign finance? They said there's four types of donations that could be made. These terms are still used today. So if you are interested in one day being a treasurer for a candidate's election committee or running for office yourself, these are the four types of donations you'll need to know about. The first is hard money donations, and that is money given directly to a candidate to spend on the success of their candidacy. Soft money or party building activities, also known as get out to vote funds, is money given to political parties to advocate not for one candidate, but for the party as a whole and getting people out to vote. So what this looks like is when people are set outside the DMV or outside of postal offices asking you to register to vote and telling you about political issues, generally, that's money raised as soft money donations. There's also independent expenditures, which Buckley versus Vallejo really created. They said you could give money to another organization that never speaks to a campaign, but still advocates on their behalf. We'll call that independent expenditures since it's money you donate independent of a candidate that can be used to advocate for the run for office. And there are no limits on independent expenditures. And finally, communication costs. Unions still stayed involved a little bit at the time, and that was advocating for candidates through publications they sent out to their many employees. And if they decided to advocate for a particular candidate, this was known as a communication cost, and they had to file it with the FEC. And finally, we got to Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce. They said if preventing corruption is a compelling interest, then it must be for corporations as well. And a uh, famous speech given by President Barack Obama when he was a sitting president said, if corporations aren't people, people are people. And this is the first time the court really took up that question. Are corporations people? If corporations are legally considered people, should they be granted the same political speech rights as human individuals? So in this case, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, they wanted to use general treasury funds to place ads in newspapers directly advocating for candidates. And the government said, no, we have a compelling governmental interest to prevent corruption or the support of corruption. And so restrictions were put in place that said specifically corporations cannot use their large economic war chest to participate in political offices. Now, they cited to a previous case, we're gonna breeze through really quick, uh, and then I'll get to some questions that have been posted. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them. But the court in that case relied on Massachusetts Citizens for Life, which really explains why corporate donations weren't allowed in campaigns at the time. The Supreme Court said that direct corporate spending on political activities raises the prospect that resources amassed in economic marketplaces could give unfair advantages in political marketplaces. And why would economic benefits be given to corporations? Well, they have lower tax rates many of times, they're given other incentives to gain wealth, and they can pull people's money together. So they're giving state-granted economic benefits that can be used to participate in politics. So the court said those benefits would make corporations have more money than individual persons, so that would give them more speech rights, and we wanted to limit or tailor those rights. I'm gonna take a quick uh, look at some of the questions that were passed around. <clears throat> oh, absolutely, so we got a first question, and that was, can you give some examples of the range of organizations that can receive independent expenditures? Typically, if you're receiving independent expenditures uh, or donations that are classified as such, you are a political action committee or a super PAC, but there are also other nonprofits, even like this group that we're talking about now, the Massachusetts Citizens for Life, that when given donations, if spending, in not in coordination with the candidate, but to assist a candidate, 
would be spending money as an independent expenditure. If you look up political action committees uh, or go on to the numerous uh, websites that track what political action committees are, are around, opensecrets.org is a website that actually lists all the political action committees in each industry of America. So healthcare, uh, gun rights, et cetera, you can go through and see what political action committees are around. Uh, but nonprofits and non-campaigns or political parties that spend money to assist a candidate are usually utilizing independent expenditures. And then I got another great question, and that is whether or not these slides will be shared. And they will be shared at the end of the presentation. And they are just another resource you can take with you to help study campaign finance. So finally, we get to one of our most modern campaign finance reform bills, and that's the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. So after the Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce uh, case was passed, the Congress got together, bipartisan, both sides of the aisle, and said, we really like Austin. Let's make that the new law of the land. And so they codified it, and they added many other laws to it. And specifically, John McCain and Mr. Feingold got together across the aisles and advocated for this law. They brought Republicans and Democrats together to pass a new campaign finance law, which would take the place of the 1970s FECA, which was the last time we had a comprehensive campaign reform. It further broke down activity and added some new definitions and classifications for what kinds of donations could be utilized by organizations. And specifically, they added electioneering communication. We're gonna take just a second to define this because it is the main, uh, it is the main stage, the main focus of Citizens United, which is arguably one of the most famous Supreme Court cases of all time. And we will finish with that case. But electioneering communication is any broadcast, cable or satellite communication that refers to a clearly identified federal candidate and is distributed 30 days before a primary or 60 days before a general election and is targeting a relevant electorate. So this was meant to cut back on TV commercials that were being aired before elections or to at least regulate who is running ads and what money they were spending. There was a loophole in place that Congress thought was allowing independent expenditures to fly under the radar and be used to use commercials on air to influence electorates. And the FEC wanted to start regulating that. But what they didn't anticipate was that streaming services like Netflix and HBO and Hulu would pop up one day, and they would also be a part of this question. Crossing now two really important areas of First Amendment rights, art and speech. And that will bring us to Citizens United. I'm gonna fly through this and then we'll get to Citizens United just for the sake of time. But uh, McConnell versus the FEC was a case where we had some unusual bedfellows come together the Democratic Party of California and the NRA and Senator Mitch McConnell actually said, you know what, we're being silenced by this new BCRA Act. We should probably see if we can get some new, uh, new higher limitations on soft money donations to political candidates. Long story short, the Supreme Court kept the BCRA in place and they said, there's not really uh, a lot of reasons why you need to spend more money than the limitations we have in place. We think they're good right now. And they moved on to a dissent, which leads us to Citizens United. So in McConnell versus FEC, Justice Scalia at the time took his first aim at campaign finance acts like the BCRA. He said, look guys, you're underestimating the problem at hand. Freedom of speech and campaign finance are one in the same. When we regulate campaign finance, we're cutting to the heart of the First Amendment. And he said, there is practically universal agreement that a major purpose of the First Amendment was to protect all speech, even corporate speech. And I want to take a minute to just reflect on that. Justice Scalia was hinting, it was almost like a movie trailer to his peers and other federal judges that he had like a trick card up his sleeve. And he just briefly cited to it in his dissent, but it was a one-off case from a long time ago called Bilotti. And we'll briefly review that as well. But that case, makes its debut in Citizens United, where Justice Scalia uses this new ammunition to break down the BCRA and put forth new rules that are now our current campaign finance regulations. We found a case, Citizens United, they were a nonprofit organization that made movies on streaming services. 
just like HBO. And they wanted to run a movie called Hillary, the movie, 30 days before the 2008 election. And let's just say that it didn't exactly advocate for Hillary Clinton. So uh, they sued the FEC for injunctive and declaratory relief. And that was just to say, hey, look, guys, we're going to publish this movie. We know we're going to get sued by the FEC because this new electioneering communication rule you have in place. And we don't want to get thrown in jail or get fined for the movie. This is just a work of art. We're not advocating for politics. And the Supreme Court was like, look, guys, this is a lot more important than an injunction. This is the quintessential campaign finance case, the history changing campaign finance case we've been waiting for. You're asking whether or not your speech as a corporation is the speech of a person. And I just referenced Westworld. Are you even real? That's really what people were asking. Are corporations people in this case? And the great divide occurred. What we had here was Justice Scalia said, look, there is a case that exists that negates all the cases we've studied so far. And you've totally forgotten about it. Back in the day, we had a case called National Bank of Boston versus Blotty that said corporations have the same speech rights as people. And all we've done is simply forget about it. And once we bring that up, because we use common law in America, we need to cite to that case and agree that corporations have the same speech rights as people and give them back their speech rights in campaigns. Now, there's two sides to this issue. First, the group that agrees that everyone should be able to speak in elections and there should be less limitations on campaign finance, they saw this as the missing puzzle piece. This is the one Supreme Court case decision they needed to really get them the laws they wanted. Whereas the other group of Americans on the other side of this issue thought of this as really the nuclear bomb they didn't know existed. They did not want this court case brought into court. They thought uh, this could destroy years of precedent they've been working on over 100 years of Supreme Court cases that supported limiting corporate speech. Some people thought it was the missing puzzle piece. Other people thought it blew up hundreds of years of trying to get certain Supreme Court justices onto the court to limit corporate donations. And what this case did was it said that views on issues of public importance do not lose First Amendment protection simply because the source is a corporation. It was exactly what Justice Scalia needed to swing campaign finance regulations. And so now we have new rules in place that state corporations do have similar speech rights as people, that money is speech, especially in political campaigns, and therefore corporations have a right to speak. So Citizens United, patched up many loopholes that were in place, but it also added many uh, new regulations in place that we still haven't even had a chance to fully understand. All we know is now corporations have similar speech rights to people, but in the sense that they can donate independent expenditures without limits. And what's happened since Citizens United is that political spending has increased. And like I said, there's two sides to the coin here. Some people believe that's really good because more speech means more opinions. And in America, that freedom will allow the best to rise to the top, where other people see more money as possibly clouding out the opinions of people. That cloud would be corporations. But millions of donations that were being made have now turned into billions of dollars of donations. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip past this last uh, case and just finish with donation limits. Today, the donation limits that are in place after Citizens United and other bills and acts that have been passed since limit individual donations to candidates at $2,800 per election cycle and your expenditures each year to political action committees at $5,000 and to your political party at the state, local, or national level at $10,000 and soft money donations to national political parties are set at $35,000. Those are the limits in place. Now, what limits no longer exist? There's no more aggregate donation limits. So you can donate $2,800 to as many candidates as you would like, and you can donate as much as you would like to political, uh, you, to political groups total. So there's no aggregate spending limit. You can donate to as many candidates or as many political parties as you would like. And as a political candidate, there are no longer limitations. So if I was independently wealthy, I could spend as much money of my own money I would like to run 
for office. And the money that's invested in politics right now has grown over the course of the last 20 years, more than $4 billion. So now there's between five and $6 billion spent in any given election cycle. And outside spending made by corporations to political action committees is well over $100 million every year. And if you wanna file uh, to run for federal office, you have to report your expenditures to the FEC through a disclosure filing. And if you're running for Congress or Senate, that would be quarterly. If you're running for president, you have to disclose those numbers every month. And that is the last question on our sheet. And now I'll open the floor for questions from you. And these are also the answers to all the review questions. So after you submit your answers, you can double check and see how you did on today's uh, class lesson and review sheet. Thank you guys so much for your time and learning about campaign finance law with me. Any questions out there, feel free to type. And Sarah, if you want to pop in and give any last word about Ballotpedia's future classes, feel free. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks everybody so much for joining and thank you especially to Avery Hill. I thought that was a fascinating presentation. Um, so we do have one other lecture in our Ballotpedia class series that is coming up on April 30th and that will be about how states select their Supreme Court justices. So I definitely encourage you to sign up for that as well if you haven't already. Um, as we've mentioned, these slides will be made available to you and this lecture will also be available on YouTube for your reference. Um, you can also send any additional questions to editor at ballotpedia.org. Um, and thanks, oh, it looks like we have one other question. Avery, I'm not sure if you wanna take that. Yeah, absolutely. And I just dropped the link into uh, here as well for the slides. It's a view only and that same link will be provided on YouTube. Uh, so we have quite a few questions popping in. I'll start to read them and answer in just a minute if you want to stick behind. <clears throat> so the first question is uh, related to the future of Citizens United. Uh, if I go back to my graph about public sentiment, I do not you know, have an opinion on whether or not there needs to be campaign finance reform necessarily. I try to write all my slides and teach all my classes from a nonpartisan stance, just to provide the necessary information to you to form your own opinion. It almost be like a shortcut in education if I gave you my opinion. Um, but the future of Citizens United, I think it's easy to tell that there is some unrest in the public right now about possible corruption in elections. And likely that would mean stricter campaign finance regulations if we just follow the graph that I provided. We're in an ebb and flow, and right now it seems like stricter regulations are wanted by the people, but we also need the elected officials in place to support those decisions. So that really comes down to how you decide to vote. So definitely look up all the candidates on Ballotpedia that you wanna support and read what they think about these issues. The next question is whether or not there's any cases currently being heard by the court that have to do with campaign finance law uh, that could possibly change the rules in place. And the answer is yes, there are a lot of cases being heard at the federal level. I've heard of some that may be bumped up to the Supreme Court, but of course, to stay on top of every single federal court jurisdiction that's hearing cases about campaign finance, I mean, this presentation could be years long. So I don't have any off the top of my mind that I've been watching. And the reason is my focus has been the federal court cases dealing with COVID right now. We've been covering it extensively at Ballotpedia. Go read all of our COVID coverage on there. But how courts are dealing with uh, mail-in ballots and things of that nature has turned my attention away from campaign finance the past few uh, months. So I wouldn't be able to give you the most up-to-date examples of campaign finance law. But definitely check out our campaign finance law page on Ballotpedia. And we have a few newsletters about, camp uh, about general federal court cases that go out that could provide this information to you. And we have two more questions here I'll take a stab at and then we'll say our goodbyes here. And feel free to send other questions as well. I can provide much more context and answers and case citations. If you type your questions into the last question box of that review sheet that I provided with your email address, I can get back to you with more structured answers. Oh, we got a great question about the three versus six FEC commissioners. 
There have been numerous questions about federal campaign finance law that the people have been seeking the opinion of the FEC about. And unfortunately, the FEC has just been unable to answer those questions without the proper number of votes. But the FEC has taken matters into a different vein. And a lot of the commissioners have been writing independent letters about the state of campaign finance that they've published on their own. They're not actual law or regulations in place because the proper number of votes are not being cast. But one day, these commissioners hope that the letters they're writing about the state of campaign finance law are useful in crafting new campaign finance regulations once the proper number of commissioners are back on the FEC. So if you go into the FEC's website and click on commissioners, every commissioner has all of their publications available there for free as PDFs. And you can see what each commissioner currently sitting on the board thinks about the state of campaign finance. The letters are short and simple, roughly two to three pages, and really answer a lot of the questions about what they think the Supreme Court thinks about the issue and what laws need to be in place to fix any issues that they see as prevailing in today's campaign finance world. And the question about how I think the Supreme Court would rule now that the justice have, justices on the Supreme Court have changed so much in the last few years, I do not know the answer, but I am itching to see how they rule on it. I can't wait for the Supreme Court to get a new case to see how they feel about corporate rights and corporate free speech rights. Justice Scalia really led the way in the last court case. And unfortunately, you know, he passed away. He's he's not there anymore. So we won't have him really leading the corporate speech right train. So we'll have to see who takes up the reins and who runs forward with a new opinion about how we should structure campaign finance law. There's no real way to guess how justices would fall on such a niche issue. And that's the last question we have. So thank you so much for the 30 plus people who stuck around for questions. That's a ton more support than I could have ever imagined for uh, such a in the weeds political topic. But I really appreciate all of your participation and keep sending us more questions via email, I'm happy to answer those as well. When a loved one is recovering from an illness and surgery- yeah, Thanks again for joining. Again, our email that you can reach us at is editor at ballotpedia.org and we'll be able to field those questions for you. Um, so thanks again, thanks Avery, um, and stay well everyone.